And um, we are, I believe, recording to the camera. We're going to take a look at the live, make sure everything's going smooth. It looks like the sound's going smooth. I'm pretty happy with that. Oh, there we are. All right. We are. I'm going to double check and just see exactly where we are with the live. Um, let's switch accounts really quickly. So uh, thank you for being here, whoever's watching. Oh, there we are. And I just want to take a look and um, I'm going to make sure that I am watching from the right account, which I believe we are. And if not, we have the camera going. And um, all else fails, we have the Zoom going. We're going to begin. So um, let's fix my shirt a little, shall we? It's a great shirt. It's very comfortable. I just would like to be a little bit more uniform with the other side. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about what it's like to um, go through the educational system. And um, some of the things I'm going to say are going to surprise a few of you. Um, some of them aren't going to surprise you at all. But um, I'm going to try to be as transparent as possible. I'm going to also try to be um, relatively kind and um, honest. But um, some things are, are definitely going to be a doozy. So uh, sit back, relax, and uh, hopefully you can um, learn something and or contribute something. This would be a good opportunity for you to uh, like right now the video or leave a comment of um, what you're expecting. Um, I like to read all the comments and get back to everyone. So um, go ahead and engage, read a, uh, like the comment, like or comment, um, leave a message, uh, talk about your own experience and let's form a little bit of community out of this because this is an important question. Um, I'm gonna start off by saying uh, the obvious. School's a business. What do I mean by schools of business? I mean that there are trillions of dollars generated from the educational system. And more often than not, decisions are made from a business standpoint versus the best interests of the student. Some argue that approaching it from a business standpoint keeps the lights going, keeps the salaries paid, and as a direct, indirect, byproduct, this is the best interest of the student. And that's an argument you have to listen to. But I believe sometimes the road to chaos can be paved with good intentions. And if those are the intentions and they're noble, great, bless you. But we have to understand for the common student, school is a business. You're looking at a, a significant amount of potential debt that you will be paying for quite some time if you do not have a plan. The school systems aren't notorious for helping you form a particular plan. They do have entrance counseling, and master promissory note counseling when you take out specific loans, subsidized and subsidized graduate plus, etc. Private loans, um, the works. Um, Let's start with, um, excuse me, let's start with the fact that 99%, 99% of those who qualified for student loan forgiveness were rejected. I had spoken with student loans personally, we had discussed this in depth, and it is a true statistic that 99% were rejected, often because of, uh, because of uh, rules that the participants didn't know about. Now you can say that's on them to have not known about the rules, but if there's a system in place where 99% get rejected of something that they should have been awarded, you have to take a look at the system. There should be no system where 99% is failure. So that in itself, excuse me, I'm sorry, those are the pups. That in itself is a problem um, and a serious problem that um, sh should take a, uh, a certain level of uh, looking into. We look at the uh, amount of money that schools are charging these students and they continue to increase. 
at alarming rates. Um, so much so that um, often the loan limits are um, are reached, and um, the only potentials after lead into um, lead into options such as. Sorry, those are the pups. Lead into options such as uh, graduate plus loans, which are credit be uh, credit based loans or personal loans. And take for example the graduate plus loan. Interest compounds from the day you start the loan. Uh, these interest rates are also pretty significant. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I want to I want to believe it's somewhere around. Four to six percent. It's a it's a pretty high interest loan. Um, you take someone that is a a medical doctor. Say they go into uh, a college for undergrad that is um, quite a bit of money. We're talking about your USC or UCLA, or even a a Cal a Cal State that's. Um, uh, more expensive than others. Some Cal states are actually pretty reasonable. I believe Cal State San Bernardino, you can get probably seven thousand a year. Uh, it's probably gone up since I last checked. But um, say you go to like a, a private institution like Cal Baptist, which you're looking about thirty to fifty thousand uh, a year on, on one of those. Um, you're looking at quite a bit of money if you're dorming. You're, you're looking at borrowing even more money. Um, if you don't have the Cal grant, which I believe is around ten thousand a year, um, it could go up depending on the school. You're you're looking at spending quite a bit of money on loans. Once you hit a certain amount of money, which I believe is one hundred twenty-eight thousand, you you run out of the amount that you are allowed to borrow. Um, medical schools and law schools give you a little bit more wiggle room because it's known that these schools are going to be expensive. But um, your your master's programs and your undergrad, they're going to cap you about 128, which I understand why they're doing this. Um, but it, it is also um, alarming that you would even reach 128 in the first place. Um, let's continue. So say you are uh, in a PhD program or whatnot and you hit your 128 limit. Um, you're going to want to then get a graduate plus loan to help you with potentially expenses or uh, furthering your tuition. Now, after that, this these loans are credit based. You can get a cosigner, but um, you need to have a pretty uh, clean credit record. They do allow for some discrepancies, but um, you're looking at something that's going to be relatively a, a clean record uh, for the uh, graduate plus loan. This is going to pick up interest quite a bit. So say you are um, you are in medical school and you're on a graduate plus loan. Um, that's going to be compounding interest from the day you get the loan. You finish medical school, now you're in residency. Say you're doing uh, um, four years of residency. You're going to be still compounding interest, but you're going to be making around fifty to $60,000 a year for those first three or four years because you're not going to make your good money until you're an attendee and you're just a resident right now. You know, you're just an intern. So as you're an intern, you're, you're making 50, 60,000 a year, but your interest is going to be skyrocketing. Your medical school chances are was at least a couple hundred thousand a year. So you're looking at walking away with a big chunk of money. Now you become an attending. Um, you get your pay boost, whether that's three hundred thousand. Some people might even be seven hundred thousand if they're in surgery or whatnot, um, which is great. This is which this is great. But now you're looking at an interest rate that has has brought your loan up quite a bit of money because you couldn't afford to pay it. Um, excuse me, excuse me. You couldn't afford to pay for school, so you started compound, compounding interest while you were in school, and then you started compounding interest your uh, residence years. So you're looking at maybe around like six to eight years that you were compounding interest <laughs> for for this loan. You know, depending, it could be more, it could be less, but um, chances are you're looking at a good amount of time that you were 
gathering quite a bit of interest on this huge loan. So um, this is a, a situation where if you did want to leave medical school and not become a, a doctor, you really don't have too many options unless you want to end up with quite a bit of debt. So my recommendation is if you're going to pursue this, you have to know what you're getting yourself into financially. If you decide not to complete your program, you could be in really financial uh, distress. There was one person that I believe was trying to be a doctor. My mom alerted me to this and he tried for a number of years and um, he, uh, he couldn't get a residency after, um, I don't know how many years, uh, I, I, I want to say 10, but he did take it to court and they exonerated him of student loans. And um, he, he uh, explained he couldn't become a doctor. He tried, um, he put in the effort, but it just wasn't happening. Um, medical schools, for example, they can be very um, competitive, but residencies can be, oh, even more competitive. We're looking at um, 50% of residencies are, are uh, American uh, medical graduates. You're looking at your foreign medical graduates and your international medical graduates, your FMGs and IMGs taking a lot of these spots, which is fine, you know, but you just have to know what you're getting yourself into. You might have a hard time getting into a residency or you might not get into the res res residency of your choice. I saw a popular um, neuros neurosurgeon on YouTube and he, it took him three years to get into his residency. He had to keep continuing to up his resume, do research, and it took him three years um, before he even got to start his residency because it was so competitive for him to get in. He almost gave up multiple times and, and almost became a, a different type of doctor, but he really wanted to be a neuroscientist and uh, he stuck, at, stuck to it and worked out for him, which is great because we, if you're gonna go down this path, it would make sense that you do a job that you love. And, being one doctor is completely different from being another, um, even though it's, it's, it's not, but it is. <laughs> so um, you really want to hopefully get into a path that you really love and admire, and, and that would be the, the hope and desire as you are um, any type of professional, let alone a medical doctor, which is gonna take you a grand number of years and a lot of debt just to get started. Um, law school is extremely similar. Now, the good news about law school is that you don't necessarily have to um, go into a residency and, and you are open to practicing multiple types of laws. That said, you have to pass the bar and the bar is a extremely tough um, multiple day test. Um, in California, it's one of the hardest bars. Um, right now, it's considered the hardest it's ever been to pass the bar. Um, but um, looking into uh, the situation, what if you don't pass the bar? I know people that took the bar over 10 times and the bar is only offered a couple times a year. So you're looking at multiple years of not being able to even utilize your skill to the best of your ability because of laws. You can do things that are like non-litigation and whatnot, potentially. You have to get really creative, but you're not going to be able to charge attorney fees because you're not, you're not, um, a practicing attorney. So situations like this make it really difficult because all the while your interest from your loans are compounding and you're getting deeper and deeper into debt. So what are you going to do? And, and that's the question that everyone really should ask themselves. What are they going to do? Because it's a serious is issue. It's a serious problem. And it's something that we have to keep in mind. Um, there's been a lot of talk about student loan debt and eliminating student loan debt, which would be great. Um, having a PhD, I, I have quite a bit of debt. I was pretty st strategic about my debt. I took a lot of grants. I took a lot of scholarships. I saved lots and lots of money from different reasons, but I did have to dip into a lot of my funds for cost of living, particularly during the pregnancy uh, that we just had not too long ago, and, and that was um, extraordinarily helpful. Um, we had to do it, and, um, and you know, if you need the money, you need the money. It is what it is. but. We're, we're talking about a situation now where, um, where I got to look at my student loans and be very, very understanding to the situation that's at hand. And I'm thankful I got a great job. I have uh, an awesome opportunity, uh, multiple sources of income to really tackle this strategically. But I was thinking about my debt, my student loan repayment years into my PhD. Um, 
before I graduated, um, some people wait until they graduate and, and until they're, they're done with it. Luckily for me, I, I was talking to student loans. I got some of the reps on the phone. I was able to communicate some of my concerns to a lot of them, and we were able to discuss some of these situations and some of these problems. So it wasn't the worst situation in the world. Granted, it was, it was a scary time, and it, it definitely is something that you have to look into and understand, hey, this is a problem. So what I'm trying to say is, is that the idea of student loan debt for me is troubling, but I came relatively prepared, as prepared as uh, I could have been for a situation like uh, what I'm in. If student loan debt was forgiven, I would be so happy. I would be, uh, I would, I would really love it. But two things, um, how are we going to forgive it? Like how, where, what are we going to do? With this amount of debt you know we have to be strategic about how we tackle it um but we can't leave this debt on our students to my knowledge this is the worst it's ever been as far as financial burden um it's not like it used to be 30 40 years ago schools are far more expensive the price gouging has been out of control you know it might cost you half a million to get a doc a, a medical degree and um, a medical doctor degree in the united states and ten thousand in spain this is something that we do in America that we've been taking advantage of these kids. Um, and, and this is why school's a business because they could, they were able to do this and they did, they raised the prices and they kept raising and raising and kept allowing for prices to go up and they knew students could get more loans and, and they, they never really addressed the problem. They just kept ca causing more money for school. And now we're, we're stuck with this mess because it's gonna be really, really hard for almost all these students to repay this debt. So if my loans were to get forgiven, I would be happy. If I end up paying all my loans off and then later loans are forgiven, I would still be happy because I struggle with the fact that most of these Americans are, are really in, in a lot of trouble. And there is an argument, I don't wanna pay your student loans. I hear that argument and I understand it and I, I sympathize with it and I hear you. Um, that said, I'd venture to say, we have to look at the big picture here. If we have um, economic collapse because of the student loan debt, um, no one wins. So we do need to figure out a strategy because it's not like it used to be. We're not talking about $5,000 of loans, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of loans for a lot of students. So, and we're also talking about, the, <laughs> we're talking about the truth that it shouldn't have been this way in the first place. So we, we have to address the elephant in the room, which is we messed up by letting it get this out of control, but now it's out of control. And we have to figure out a way to, um, to fix this with uh, strategy. So at this point, I would like to hear some of your thoughts and some of your opinions. Please leave a comment, a like, um response um anything um you know we're we're just talking here there's no right or wrong answers we're just really discussing i want you to know i respect you i respect your opinion so hopefully you can leave something and some feedback and we can talk more about this later um until then i will see you next time